together. And we, if we may uh, start, um, as uh, we all know that uh, the background or backdrop uh, of this um, year is, has been defined by a number of factors. And we just want to say uh, the challenging operating environment continues to persist. And for just a, a, a casual reminder of uh, what is characterizing the, env the environment, uh, the adverse effects of the worst drought recorded in the last 70 years uh, is, has significant ramifications uh, to the economy. One on energy, uh, second on water, uh, food, of course, import of food and consequently impact on exchange rate and uh, most likely on uh, the physical uh, policies and monetary uh, policy as uh, a result. The challenge with this drought is that um, the predictions are that uh, the drought has been followed by below average rains for the season March uh, to May, meaning that uh, uh, going forward, the yields from the agricultural sector might still be low. But the impact is on inflation, and as we can see, inflation is now at 11.4 uh, from the latest uh, recording. And that tells you when the central bank rate is 10 and inflation is above that, and the upper set target was 7.5, inflation is a major factor uh, for any consideration. The second uh, uh, challenge that we continue to have it's a struggling banking sector. Ideally, uh, the rubricant of the bank says, and giving those who have deficit. And that mechanism, when inflation is above uh, the bank rate, it means lending. Uh, uh, the impact of any lending is that you don't recover or cover the value of money. So lending is uh, significantly at a loss. Whatever you try to do, at the gross level, you are losing money uh, any time you lend uh, because of loss of value of the money you have lent. So that continues to be a challenge and makes it very difficult uh, for the banking industry to quickly recover. So it is the microeconomic environment that is a big challenge. The third factor that we continue to, uh, to play with is the uncertainty in the banking industry. The public confidence, uh, and we know this started off um, uh, in September 2015, when we had Chase Bank followed by Imperio um, having challenges. And what happens is that uh, we have a dual banking system. And as you can see, the interest rates in the interbank reflect the duality of the market. The big six banks, as you can see, have an interbank rate, the blue line, as low as 4%. But uh, the rest of the banks, as you can see, they are paying in the market interbank as high as 15. So you can see the duality of what does that mean? It means that the interbank mechanism is not functioning uh, properly. And again, that uh, makes it difficult. The banks that have excess liquidity are not able to pass it to the banks that uh, have um, deficits in liquidity. And as a result, we are seeing the mechanism of intervention that has come into place is through the central bank. And you can see the reverse repo is uh, much bigger. Yeah, I, I think move on to that slide. If you look at the impact, what it means is that uh, the, the banks that don't have liquidity have to wait for the banks that have liquidity to buy reverse repo and then they borrow from central bank. And as you can see this quarter, the first quarter, uh, the total borrowing of the, bank, uh, the banking industry from the central bank uh, reached 163 billion. So if you could imagine that uh, by the second quarter of 2015, it was zero. It just tells you uh, that the banking industry still have um, challenges that it's contending with. 
and as a result is not able to play its, uh, effect, uh, its role effectively uh, in the economy. And of course, uh, the last aspect of it is that the banks, when, uh, with all these challenges, the banking sector uh, gross loan growth has now started contracting. If you compare January 2016, like just last year, the credit growth by the banks was at 15.5. This January, as you can see, it has contracted to z negative 0 0.1. And you can see z as February. And so the contraction of lending is very, very significant. Moving from an up of uh, a high of 15 to a, high, uh, to a negative 0 0.5, it shows how big uh, this uh, contraction is. And essentially, what you could say it's uh, we have a sick banking sector uh, and essentially then uh, uh, Im uh, impairment of intermediation then uh, ha causes havoc on the economy and we'll see the net effect of all this and lastly for the banking sector is that uh, it has not helped that uh, because the economy has started getting the through uh, the lamification is uh, the sector is not pay, paying the banks for the loans they had borrowed. And the non-performing loan book had continues to increase. And when you talk of um, a 10%, because we can uh, take 9.7 uh, and allow it to 10%, and say 10% of the loan book is not performing. Banks need to provide for it. Banks need to write it off and banks are charging an average of about 12%, then you start seeing we seem not to have an a strong mechanism of uh, distributing resources in an economy is not functioning. The economy eventually feels uh, uh, the challenge. And uh, lastly, markets never lie. You can see the recognition of the markets as to the weakness of the banking industry. There is no industry that has been hit hard as the banking industry in terms of erosion of stock value. And as you can see, it's fairly significant, averaging uh, 40%. And when uh, stocks of an industry or a sector loses 40% of its value, yes, it's a very good opportunity for new entrants, those who can understand or can be able to assess uh, the turning point of the banking industry. But it is not very good, because the results of uh, the insurance companies will reflect this diminution in value of the stocks they bought. Uh, so the, the effect is likely to be significant. Investment clubs, look at pension funds. Where will money come from? Because if you sell your stocks now in the banking industry, you actualize that loss. It becomes an actual loss. It's not a book loss. It's not a paper loss. It is uh, a total sum uh, issue uh, that uh, we are talking about. And lastly, then, uh, is uh, this debate on, of interest rates that are below inflation, a dual uh, interbank rate in the market has very significant effect on the economy uh, because of uh, monetary policy is driven by interest rate to control both um, inflation and exchange rate. So what it means is the, the gear lever of the monetary policy has got stuck. And the central bank can no longer be able to effect an effective monetary policy. Why? Because the lever is no longer moving. And it was worse when the interest rates in the interbank are far below. At the moment, as we saw, the big banks are enjoying between four and five interbank rates consistently. And the central bank rate is at 10, two times. So whatever you do with the central bank rate has no effect. Uh, on uh, uh, the decisions of the banks. It means that uh, there is a complete impairment between the monetary policy tools and the interest rates in the marketplace. Uh, and essentially that makes it pretty difficult. Of course, 
outside Kenya, the economy still has to contend with global trends because of interconnectedness. We are now a, a globally interlinked um, um, economy. Uh, we are heavily linked. So when you look at interest rates in the US starting to go up, then you wonder, will they froze to the emerging markets, and particularly Africa, given the risks, continue to flow, or people will now focus on the high returns. Over the last 15 months, interest rates in the US have been increased three times. Is US investments going to become more attractive than uh, investing in emerging markets? And of course, uh, uh, we expect that uh, given that this is now, we are back to 2008 position. Before 2008, you find uh, the flow of global investments were tied pay principally to the US. Will we have the same scenario? And what will happen to uh, global capital markets uh, if that happens? So again, that becomes. And of course, there are two or three other things that uh, continues to bother as of, uh, uh, those of us have to, that have to um, contend uh, with economic forces. And the first one is uh, the continued debate of Donald Trump's presidency, what will it entail? And the commencement of this uh, famous investigation, I think last week, what does it tell? It has brought huge uncertainty. Will Donald Trump now be able to push on with his policies, with th those investigations? Brexit has commenced, what does it mean? Uh, that uh, now they have triggered the commencement of the process. And uh, of course, China, so the SRAM, uh, the slowdown. We saw yesterday um, its uh, credit rating uh, was lowered uh, by Moody. What does that mean when uh, China's uh, debt uh, uh, sustainability is questioned and its rating is globally reduced? What will it mean, given China is the biggest consumer uh, in the world? And of course, lastly, is the slam on uh, commodities. With Donald Trump choosing to sell half of the American uh, uh, um, stock of oil, what will happen uh, to the oil prices? We saw last week, but one, they fell by 5%. Will that uh, really continue? And what will happen if the dollar, if the petroleum dollars are removed from circulation or investment uh, circles? So those are questions that uh, we don't have answers for, but uh, we have to be prepared for them. I don't want to suggest uh, that life will not have predictions on the growth rate of Kenya from 6.1 to 5.3. Uh, from 6 to 5.5. So you can see a 100 basis point reduction on GDP growth rate is fairly significant. It's fairly significant. So it is important that um, uh, when uh, we are looking at these results uh, to bear in mind that this is... Uh, but uh, let's look whether there are opportunities. Is there a silver lining? And uh, we feel there is a bit of silver lining which gives a balance sheet that uh, could allow reallocation of resources. And you have to have a management team and a leadership team that is up to the game. You know, because essentially, you now have to almost go with a microscope to look for those opportunities. Because as we saw, the headwinds are very significant. They are at the sector level, banking sector level, they are at the economy level, and essentially, they are at the global level. So every um, environment within which uh, we interact with their challenges. So let's look at uh, what we see as opportunities. The first opportunity we see is the global oil price remaining depressed. And this is not from flow of funds, it's from ourselves the cost of doing business. So as equity bank, we see the value chain, the energy value chain, particularly uh, oil-based uh, sectors as the best of uh, sectors to operate in. Why? Because their costs are down by 50%. So if you really uh, connect with that sector, uh, particularly oil-dependent uh, industries, uh, they are doing very, very well. Why? Because their costs 
are down by over 50%. If you look, uh, 2015, a barrel of, of oil was at uh, 110, and it's now at 47. It means that uh, the cost of doing business for that industry is below 50%. And when you quantify it for an economy, because Kenya is a net importer, then you see, oh, Kenya spends 25% of its foreign exchange importing oil, and now oil is 50%. So you see the reserves, if you look at uh, the next slide, you see what has happened. Despite all the challenges we are talking about, the reserves are almost spending 12% uh, uh, of our imp uh, imports uh, on oil, as opposed to 25% uh, of uh, the total bill. So significant impact, and that really provides a huge opportunity. The question is, you have to track where else will these uh, foreign reserves be used? And we have identified these are in infrastructure. And the question is, how well can we position ourselves on the vertical of value chains? of infrastructure, because the money is being used on infrastructure. Who else is importing if it's not oil? Uh, and you look at that and um, you see the opportunity. And we can see uh, pretty well, unfortunately, this doesn't uh, really, I, th I wish uh, Alex, you could look at uh, the US dollar curve. It's not coming out uh, as strong as the second curve. But that's where the CASA is, that's where the Rhine is, and we are seeing uh, that uh, the Kenya shilling is strengthening against the dollar. Despite all the challenges we saw, because sometimes you get scared if you don't uh, do a deep dive, the economy is not as bad. Why export reserves are at their best, 5.4 times, and a stable exchange rate. That's a very important factor at a time like this. You can see, despite the capital imports for Vision 2030 projects, the infrastructure project, the stability in exchange rate. It's simply uh, a good uh, environment to be operating in. I think uh, the cushion on uh, Brexit, we talked about uh, uh, the headwind of Brexit, uh, but the French uh, uh, election, with a, EU, uh, a, a new pro-EU presidency gives now certainty that the Euro uh, zone with France and Germany will now be a stable environment. And we can see what has immediately happened. The election of uh, Macron has seen, for instance, the banking stocks in France up 7.5%. The banking stocks are uh, expected to uh, up, outperform the French stock exchange. The, you, you can see what has the European Central Bank has started thinking of raising interest rates. Global. So it appears the risk of the euro is dissipating. The Brexit uh, crisis seems now to be resolved. So we can see here yeah, there is a silver lining in the sense that they are uncertainty. What does that mean for Kenya? The export of cut flowers to, uh, to Europe, the export of um, with the certainty that the markets will not misbehave. There is almost certainty. And again, equity sees that opportunity to redefine um, the flower industry, the hot culture, and most of the products that we export um, uh, to Europe. I think for Kenya, when you do a proper deep dive on Kenya, despite all the challenges we talked about, Kenya seems to uh, have that as it contracts its expansionist uh, outlook for Africa, it will have all its economic activities in Kenya. And that is why we saw uh, significant funding uh, of this uh, phase two of SGL. That's why we, the continued funding of loads, the continued funding of grants, and most important and most significant will connect through Kenya. And, and that eventually means that uh, as industries become squeezed uh, in China with rising labor cost, most of them will most likely will relocate to our special economic zone in uh, Mombasa. And uh, that will really be a game changer uh, for Kenya. Uh, the second one is uh, improving microeconomic conditions, particularly the ranking of ease of doing business. And we have witnessed over the last uh, six months I think about four uh, 
uh, motor assembly companies have set shop in Kenya. And you can see how quickly investments uh, can start moving. This follows the relocation of uh, global brands uh, in Nairobi from Johannesburg. So there is a continued um, positive trend on foreign direct investment. And it's good to know uh, that um, Kenya has improved as the preferred um, uh, investment destination ahead of South Africa and Nigeria. And when uh, really uh, you beat those two, uh, then uh, chances are Kenya will lead a struggle to cope uh, with uh, uh, providing facilitation for the flows. And that is why the government have set the one-stop shop to find the ground was broken for the highest uh, uh, skyscraper in Africa, seven-story building in Upper Hill. What does that mean? Start realizing Nairobi is changing. I think you need just to look at Nairobi uh, hotels. We struggled to get an AGM uh, venue for almost two months. Good day that we could the place is fully six point. We can see is, is uh, the sub Sahara Africa GDP 2016 averaged 1.3. Kenya was at uh, 5.9, first capping in the second quarter. While the uh, the credit, if you look, the Kenyan bank, the Kenyan subsidiary, started to grow slower than the group, essentially. And as you can see, by end of uh, last uh, year, we were down to 5% five, uh, 5 we are down to 9% in the first quarter in Kenya, bringing now the whole group to down to 5%. One would ask James, are you not worried about uh, the trade-off? But the yield on government treasuries and yields on loans are the same. The only difference is you skip the risk. And the risk is very expensive because the average sector banking industry, NPLs are at 10. That th thought process, and I want to approach. If you look at uh, the area that we have had very significant problems, it is in the micro enterprises. And basically what equity has done is to say you can't lead at 14 when your NPLs are 11.5. And so essentially that is where the decline in uh, leading is. And what have we focused on? We have focused on uh, the SMEs and uh, large enterprises. We haven't been successful with agriculture because of the drought, uh, but again, Agriculture has been a fairly solid uh, state. So the only area that uh, we have really uh, controlled that the lighting is the world, where risk free rewards more than risk assets. I've never seen any other economy. And so banks, when we keep on challenging, there is no way out of this mechanism. Because rational behavior always persists in markets. This is a marketplace, so national behavior, and you see. And if you go one slide back, um, oh. two slides back, maybe one more slide back, one more. You see what uh, is happening. The risk-free asset is growing at 81 percent while the net loans are growing at negative five. Oh, sorry, negative nine in Kenya. Why? Because it's a market behavior. It's all about following the market uh, discipline and mechanism. So if we continue, uh, the next area that we have really focused on is NPL coverage. And this is where, again, equity has uh, uh, distinguished itself completely. We have watched the results of the banks that have published, and have almost all the banks have reduced their provisions. Some with as high as 33%, others as, as high as 40%. Equity has adopted a cautious 
provisioning system. And I want to say we still, despite the loan book, remaining constant. And as you can see, the only area, the yellow line, is uh, where we are talking about uh, Q16 and Q7, uh, quarter one of 17 uh, is the area that we have seen significant growth uh, in uh, NPLs, as we can see, is in the large enterprises, which is fully secured, large enterprises, from zero to six. And SMEs from 3.7 to 7.4, because it's a shock in the, ma in the marketplace. These are the people who contract the government. This is where payments are, are becoming through. This is where that is fully secured. But despite these sectors being fully secured, what we have done is to increase our provisions. And if you look as we go through the numbers, you see this year we still have increased provisions from last year's provisions, despite that the non-secured loans has not increased in uh, NPLs. The NPLs are purely uh, in uh, the secured uh, portfolio. So a lot of focus there. And that also explains why coverage would not be a concern. Why? Because we know the large enterprises. Uh, the, it's just a question of timing. Uh, uh, there will be no real need. And going forward, the next um, focus is uh, what uh, seems to have been uh, the biggest uh, area of focus uh, for the last two quarters, uh, the regional banking subsidiaries. And we can see uh, what has happened. We have been very, very well rewarded. As we can see, DLC profitability is up 182%. Uganda uh, profitability is up 194% and Rwanda is up 117, and even Tanzania, which was slow, is up 45%. So this really, if you can see, when you look at contribution to profitability of the group, in just one quarter, the, uh, the subsidiaries have doubled their contribution to the group profit from 5% uh, first quarter of 2016 to 10%. And we hope uh, if they sustain these, uh, then uh, uh, these will be able to propel the group or uh, to be able to effectively override the shock in Kenya. And uh, we really can count that, again, the decision to focus on these subsidiaries. Why? The yields here, and we shall see that the growth in loan book, if you look at uh, the loan book, yes, the loan book is growing at uh, DRC at 26, Uganda at 36, Rwanda at 18. Um, it is, so it's not about lending, it's where the market forces are light. That's, and what the good thing is that this then helps us to mitigate the yields. As this loan book grows, it uh, really downplays the interest capping in Kenya. And uh, we hope by the end of this year, uh, the loan growth will be significant uh, to contribute uh, beyond 20%. At the moment, the loan book uh, is contributing 20%. That's the same as deposit, contributing 10% of profit. And we hope we'll be able to push this to 30% before the end of the year. If we push that to 30%, then effectively we'll be able to mitigate uh, the reduction of interest uh, rates in Kenya because the interest rates uh, in the whole region are still at around 20%. So effectively, that will be able to undermine the impact of Kenya. Lastly, let me put um, again attention uh, to South Sudan. I think I was quoted on Tuesday as saying South Sudan is now dormant. As we can see, South Sudan has no any impact now on uh, the group profitability. If you look at the column of South Sudan, profit before tax is zero, zero. There is no impact on the group. So uh, anybody who thinks uh, uh, that uh, the performance will be, it's not going to be affected. And if you look with or without uh, South Sudan, uh, you can see the profit contribution remains 10. Uh, the, as, uh, the loan book remains the same 20 deposits, uh, or remains uh, in actual, it's higher from 19 to 20, so Sudan is no longer a factor. It's no longer a factor uh, in terms of performance, and you should not in any way price 
South Sudan anymore in your projection because we have driven it to maintenance level. Just maintain the license, ensure there are no losses coming from South Sudan. Uh, and essentially, I must also applaud uh, the management uh, for really, uh, particularly the strategy that was adopted to ensure South Sudan doesn't drag the group going forward. Um, yeah, the last uh, areas of focus is uh, extracting value from subsidiaries, making subsidiaries uh, contribute. And we can see, if you look at uh, uh, deposit, while Kenya continues uh, to grow faster than the subsidiaries, uh, first quarter 2016, uh, it contributed uh, 78, now it is contributing almost 80% uh, of all the deposits, as we saw. When it comes to profitability, uh, the position you see uh, which is changing. The area that has changed significantly is in the loan book. And that is why we are saying the interest effect will significantly be undermined by the fact that last year, first quarter, Kenya was at 85% of the loan book. It's now at 80. It has been reduced by five percentage points in terms of loan contribution. And that is being taken up by the subsidiaries that are able to enjoy fairly good rates in terms of interest rates in the marketplace. And if you want to do a deep dive, that is look at the deposit growth rate. While Kenya is growing at 18%, DLC is growing at 25%. Rwanda at 29, and uh, Tanzania 17. So we see significantly the subsidiaries are, and if you look at the other parameter in terms of loans, next slide, uh, you'll see um, the same happens uh, in terms of uh, uh, profit. Uh, Kenya down 12%, but DLC up 182 Tanzania up 45 percent, Uganda up 195, Rwanda up 117, and uh, Rwanda, uh, South Sudan comes to zero, as uh, literally. And essentially, what will happen then? You see that 12. Let's look at that 12. How significantly it will be reduced? That negative 12 in Kenya is then significantly reduced. So I want to say what really will work for equity is this focus on uh, subsidiaries, uh, uh, the regional subsidiaries, and we hope um, we'll surprise the market by the end of the year. Uh, going forward, um, again, in terms of uh, profitability, we see Kenya da coming down. Last year, this quarter, Kenya had contributed 96%. As we can see, it is uh, reduced to 90%. And uh, so some of uh, the subsidiaries, like DLC, which had 1%, uh, is now uh, punching at 3% of the total, 300% almost uh, uh, growth. And even Rwanda, as small as it is, from 0 0.8, is now pa uh, punching at 1.8. Tanzania, uh, Uganda from 1.2, to 3.8, and Tanzania uh, from 1.1 uh, to 1.8. And uh, as uh, South Sudan, we have said it's uh, flat. The second is what the strategy we have been focusing on. And this, again, is something one, particularly those who have templates, you need to note because it's very significant. The shift from funded income uh, to non-funded income. And as you can see, uh, last year, this time, uh, we had uh, only 33% of uh, the income coming from uh, non-funded. That has increased by 10 basis point to 42%. Reducing uh, interest contribution from loans from 67 to 58, another whooping. Uh, what does that mean? The quality of earnings has significantly been enhanced because uh, non-funded income is realized income and there is no hanging risk. There is no provisions, there is no light off. So uh, the, uh, what you could call risk income 
is significantly being reduced, and we're very, very proud. Our target for this year was 38%, uh, and I'm glad that we are not even at 40, we are at 42, and we think this will accelerate going forward uh, to make sure that the bank, and again, this is a game changer uh, for the bank. But what is driving non funded income? Is it sustainable? Again, uh, what we talked about, strategic initiatives. Last year we were talking about strategic initiatives. They are now paying big time. So we are talking about performance that is directly linked to strategy. It's all about uh, uh, strategy. So the initiatives, let's see the initiatives that are paying. The first one is mobile banking, Equitel. The transaction income is up 75%. And uh, transaction income in uh, mobile will, be, will continue to scale. Diaspora remittances, and we said we'll focus on diaspora remittances, they are up 79%. Trade finance, because of SMEs, remember we said we'll focus on SMEs, 78%. SWIFT and RTGS, again payments, up 28%. Agency commission, are 19%. Agency is no longer a cost. Notice agency is now contributing. It used to be a cost uh, we're paying, but now agency has a net effect of uh, contribution. And the merchant commission is, these are the drivers. And we hope before the end of the year, treasury, forex, and uh, fixed income trading will be on this side. And uh, we are working very hard uh, to get treasury to reflect on this slide. Uh, and hopefully that uh, will be a fairly game changer. So if you look at uh, the drivers of that T shift from funded to non funded they are sustainable and scalable. They are the growing lines and will continue to grow because we saw diaspora remittances are growing. We saw mobile, we have seen what it is. We see trade finances tied to SMEs and we expect that uh, that, that will continue uh, to significantly grow. And we hope uh, Merchant Commission, again, will also bounce uh, back like it has been, growing at around 30%. The other area that uh, we have really focused on is latent value. We strongly believe, and we, have, uh, no, we are not shy about it, interest capping, where it has been done, is not sustainable. And it's just a question of time for that, uh, in one way or another, uh, to be amended. Why? Otherwise, it will cripple the whole market, as we have seen. The GDP is started to do. We have seen the corporates are not paying. That's why it's the corporates that are affected. That's why NPLs are in corporate. Essentially, equity has decided that it will create embedded value or latent value. What does that mean? It has meant that Instead of focusing on growing loans, why don't we focus on growing deposits? So that uh, when uh, the act is changed, we'll have the resources to bo go big in lending. And as you can see, we are outperforming the market by far. When the, uh, the third quarter of 2016, the banking industry was growing at 3, we were growing at 22. Fourth quarter, when the industry grew at 8, we grew at 17. First quarter, when the industry is flat, we have grown by 18. And that is what we are keeping as liquidity. Real significant resources that could quickly be mobilized to, uh, if the opportunity uh, was to occur. But the more important thing, uh, because sometimes people just think growth is, look at what has happened on our market share. From uh, 2016 uh, to 2017, or uh, 2016, we have increased our market share by nearly 100 basis point. In a market with 43 banks, if you're able to increase your market share by a whooping one percentage point from nine to 10 percent, and you can see it's the same with 2014, 2015, uh, it becomes very significant. We are glad to say 2017, as we have all seen, is looking even better than 2016. And we expect uh, we should be above 11 percent of uh, the market share uh, by the end of the year. Again, building capacity. 
enhancing capacity that when uh, the tide turns, resources will be very significant. This is the 81%. You can see it is the treasury bills. And again, let me try to explain this a little bit more. That 81% growth in treasury bills is not reallocation from credit to treasury bills. It's new deposits. And with a spread of 8% and above, of all these new nearly 8 billion shillings, you can see it's a direct um, uh, uh, flow to the PNL. And we'll see how the PNL will be affected. So again, this is something of where you have a template you need to monitor about uh, the latent value uh, that is being built uh, within the, uh, the balance sheet. Um, the next slide that uh, one may want to, to think very, very carefully, because this is going to be a game changer, is Equity's new banking model, the digital bank. We have talked about digital bank. It's a new phenomenon. We started last year in November. We launched uh, digital products, a suite of 12 products. This is supposed to make banking easy, secure, and convenient, and more importantly, speak to the new reality of our demography. 80% of the population of Kenya is below 35. These are not people who want to go to the banking home. The mean age of Kenya is 19 years. This is the digital generation. So as a digital native, uh, being the bulk of the population, we have decided to create for them a bank that is appropriate and relevant to them, the digital bank. And what the digital bank has done is to remove distance and time in their lives. We have compressed distance and time. They can do banking 24 hours, wherever they are, because banking is what they do on their phone or they do on their computers is not what they do at the banking hall. And I can project and prophesy this will be another disruption that equity has introduced. And as you can see, EasyNet is personal internet banking. EasyBiz is cash and liquidity management, uh, um, internet-based uh, cash, uh, cash and liquidity management system for businesses. Easy app allows uh, integration of systems, business systems, SME systems, corporate systems, straight to the bank, and essentially allows a flow of transactions. Easy diaspora portal allows diaspora, and that's why diaspora income is growing at 79%. Easy app, again, uh, we know what uh, it has done. The app that everybody is downloading, that has allowed us now to provide the equitel service network without us having to negotiate uh, with the telecom network. Any customer of a network, whether you are in any of the four, you download this app and it acts as if, as if you have equitel. That's what it, and of course, uh, equitel, uh, which is really, so essentially what we have really done is make it very convenient, very easy, and secure for everybody. But how has been uh, the initial performance? What we are seeing is very significant movement. As we can see, uh, Easy App is growing at an accelerated rate of 28% compounded on a monthly basis. Not annually, month on month growth rate of 28%. So you could imagine what the annual growth rate will be if the monthly growth rate is 28%. That is on number of transactions. When you look at value, it's growing at a compounded growth rate month on month of 53. If you can't call this phenomenon growth, I don't know what you could call it. Eric, what would you call it? So essentially, that's the first product. Let's look at the second product, um, which is EasyNet. This is personal internet banking. 32% month-on-month growth rate with the value 
growing at 32%. This is because it's individuals, uh, that level, the value of transactions is not as high as the number of transactions. So essentially that is what is expected because those are payment. Let's go to the easy bees. I have very big, and we talked about businesses. And this is what would disrupt and position equity as the corporate bank. Last year, we have uh, our director of corporate banking, Rohit, was voted the best uh, corporate banker in the country. This year, corporate banking of equity has been voted learners up, corporate banking, uh, a corporate bank in the country, and uh, our cash and liquidity management champion was voted the uh, young aspiring corporate banker of the year. Uh, Gaki, are you in the room? Uh, we don't have. And, and you can see this product is going to change equities positioning. It has made people change perception. Those who thought equity bank is for the farmers and uh, uh, workers and uh, micro enterprises suddenly has found equity as the most powerful tools of supporting business. We designed it for SMEs, but it appears it is most appropriate for the corporates. So you find the corporate segment, which is lower risk, high volume, and ability of equity to accelerate growth will be driven by these products. The next, pro and we have seen, sorry, uh, that uh, on average, number of transactions are growing by 56%, while volume, because this is now businesses, is growing at uh, 78%. Month on month, this is not uh, uh, year on year, is month on month. So when you compound a monthly growth rate of 78 on annual basis, that is dramatic growth. And this is going to completely change the landscape of banking um, in Kenya. Is the pay. Easy pay is what uh, we call little uh, payments that will change uh, the, uh, this is intended to remove cash from retail trade. It's the shopkeepers, and we can see month on month growth rate, 171, but volume of value growing at a compounded monthly growth rate of, uh, of 718. Again, and that's why we said these products are a game changer uh, for the Kenyan market. And of course, the innovation of equity. Uh, look at it, we now control 22% of the value and 20% of the count of all transactions of money transfer in the country. We have continued to grow. Our prediction is that uh, because these numbers are as at December, as at March, and we, and we can check this in the next uh, one month because the numbers will be released. We think we have reached 25% of the total market share uh, in the market. Uh, this continuous growth, and we saw the transaction income, how it is coming from the mobile. So we expect this to continue now to, to be a game changer. What does all this mean? And uh, we can see the growth on average, Equitel, uh, it still remains uh, very good. Average of 4%, so that is 48%. Because it's on month on month, if you do annualize, it will be on nearly 48. Average is 6. If you annualize that, it's 72%. So it continues to be a big mover. We monitor it, and we can see the agency uh, transactions, how they are growing up to March. We can see continuous growth, and that's why we are sure we will reach 25% uh, of the total because this is an indicator. W Let me pause here and talk a little bit agency. Agency is what we call shared prosperity. We have brought prosperity that equity has created and shared with our customers. These are 30,000 of our customers we gave agency network. What have they done? To be able to do these six million transactions within a month, or, or transactions, sorry, uh, 43 million transactions in a month worth, sorry, six million transactions worth 43 billion, they have employed 20,000 
new staff. Yes, there are 30,000. 10,000 have not been able to employ specific staff, but 20,000 of our agents have now employed and we have trained specific staff. People talk about, oh, 400 staff of Equity Bank. 400 staff have been replaced by 20,000 new staff. That is how we have created prosperity in the, in the marketplace. And we're very proud that um, on daily basis, every day we pay a minimum of 2 million shillings to our agents uh, without a, a corresponding cost. Because that is, there is no, uh, no cost of goods. There is no cost of uh, purchasing goods. It's a service you are offering, and at the end of offering service, you receive two million shillings on daily basis. That shared prosperity has built the brand and enabled us, to our presence, to be top of mind. And that explains why we are growing faster than any other bank in the country. Uh, if we move um, to the next one, let's look at uh, efficiency. We have focused on an efficiency, and we said it ultimately will be able to manage our cost. And this, there has been a huge debate, can lead equity keep on its promise. And we want to just uh, show how much we have moved from the, variable, uh, from the fixed cost. We can see the fixed cost, uh, the, as there are the branches and ATMs. And you can see the negative growth. But when you look at the digital channels, look at Equitel growing as we had earlier predicted. Uh, we were take, talking of four times uh, 12, 48%, so you can see it's at 57. Agency at 13%, merchant 11%, and you can see corresponding value of transactions. For agency, it's 8 and 9%, because it was 6. We had the projected simply 72%. We income has slunk, as we saw, very significantly. But look at cost income ratio. Kenya cost income ratio last year, this time, was 43.3, we are now at 42, what we targeted to achieve in five years. On the third year, Kenya has achieved, and as you can see, even the group, despite the expansion, and the income growing very significantly, the cost income ratio of the group is flat, and that's why we are able to achieve uh, zero growth on uh, cost. We expect this to accelerate, we believe Kenya who most likely touch 41, and the group will touch 47 before the end of uh, the year. That's really our prediction. And uh, uh, lastly is the fortified blood. We continue to fortify our blood. We did take pride that we are not now rated among uh, Kenyan banks, East African banks, African banks, we are globally. And as you can see, 2016, we were able to maintain our position on return of assets as the eighth best of the one top thousand banks. And we continue to improve in soundness, and we believe uh, and, and ranking our size, moving from 916 to 835, and we can't wait for end of this year. And more importantly, we have also maintained our rating, our rating, global rating, and our uh, stabil uh, and an outlook of stability despite the crisis. So when they put all the factors and mitigations we have done, uh, we are neutral to the crisis in the banking industry in Kenya, and we have a stable outlook. Uh, and the second impact that we have looked is then, um, and this, but it's because James is strong. But look, all the sectors, we entered into the banking industry, and I'm glad, uh, although you are here. The maximum awards we could get was 24, because there were only four, 24 entries that we had entered. We got 19 awards out of a maximum 24. What impressed me most was 14, we were number one. These are different sectors. So you can imagine, you go to the best bank overall, equity. Tier one bank, best bank, equity, best retail bank, equity, best commercial bank in microfinance, equity, best bank in agency, equity, best bank in mortgages, equity. I, I, I would really like to compose this as a song. <laughs> but because you have the screen, please join me in the callers uh, and see the performance. And you can see dominating 
And it's not just performance. All these sector heads are then the best in the banking industry. And uh, I was really humbled uh, that uh, the bank would provide, uh, uh, produce the chief executive of the year, an outstanding young, young banker of the year. So it's not about product. It's about even people, the quality. Something that the market has never fully appreciated. What distinguishes equity from the rest of the bank is quality of leadership and people and depth of leadership. And the fact that we could get 14 number one awards out of 24 shows the quality of people and awards. And if there is anything I'm very proud of, it's the staff of Equity Bank, it's the board of Equity Bank, it's the management of Equity Bank, it's the executive. And you can see, that position, out of 24, only one award. Uh, that really shows you how big the bank has moved. And it's not uh, a law might be said, a law might know the 19 awards are here. But what then also gives us uh, even more is as a fintech, as a mobile bank, uh, we, in digital bank, we have been recognized to be the most innovative bank by the banker and also the best mobile service bank in Africa. And again, this again testifies that it's not just in Kenya. And if you go next uh, slide, uh, this is uh, 2017. The, the banker has given out awards uh, this year. These are the awards that the, uh, the fired. Best retail bank in East Africa, Equity Bank. Best retail bank in Kenya, Equity Bank. Best retail bank have acknowledged and recognized. And we hope this will permit to the public so that they can know the safe, secure bank for their money. And again, even uh, not just uh, the Think Business Bank, Africa's best SME bank, Equity Bank. Kenya's best bank, Equity. The consistency is sufficient, you can no longer doubt. And this brand is what we wanted to build a reliable, dependable bank that can be trusted on and that can pass the test anywhere, not just in Kenya, not in East Africa, not in Africa, but, uh, and again, this reflects the quality of people, the thought process and the strategy. Top of mind, Brad, we have maintained the super Brad status in Kenya and East Africa for the last 10 years, without ever losing this position. And again, this is the public voting, the banking super brand for 10 years. Two, a child has been born and now is in standard five, equity maintaining. It's easy to go up, but it's very difficult to maintain yourself at the top, but equity has maintained that position for 10 consecutive years in a very competitive market. And again, that, um, and this, we believe, is what is causing customers to lead a shift in equity and grow at 18%. Now, equity, despite all that, has been kind and generous and say to maintain the brand, not just from a financial perspective, but also from a social impact perspective. And despite uh, the challenging environment, equity continues to invest in social impact. The number of wings to bribe beneficiaries have now reached 15,000 at a cost of 14 billion shillings. FINCA, or Financial Literacy Training for Africa, has now reached 1.5 million youth, women, and micro entrepreneurs. When you train 1.5 million people in a country, your significance and impact can't be missed. The airlift to Global Reading University has now reached uh, 400 students at a total cost of 9.6 billion shillings. No wonder we, nobody can beat us on CSR or in the banking industry. It's not just numbers, it's the actual cost. 600 small-scale peace and farmers transformed into businesses through training. 25,000 entrepreneurs receiving a three-year entrepreneurship training and 2,500 medium-scale farmers supported to transform through value addition, it's just so that we start doing value addition uh, in the economy. So the brand is not just an economic brand, it's a social brand. And to a great extent, the, the social value is larger than the economic value. 
uh, of this blood. And essentially, essentially, this blood has created um, a sustainable uh, strategy within the environment in which it is operating. So allow me now to look at uh, what holds all this together. It's the people, it's the governance structure. That is the management and leadership structure and the oversight. If you look at the oversight of equity, it's so high that there is central bank, there is CMA, there are shareholders through the AGM, there is a Nairobi Stock Exchange, and as we saw, there is global rating agencies. We are really heavily monitored for on behalf of the, the public. But you can see the way authority is exercised. Nobody in equity has uh, uh, authority on their own. As you can see, uh, I wish Ruben was sitting here. He could have completed the team in my office. Why don't you sit here temporarily? This is my office now. Uh, we are four of us, Director of Governance, Strategy, Legal and Company Secretary, Mary, Mary, you can uh, wave. Di uh, Director, Strategic Execution. Where is Karobi? Karobi is not with us today. He's in training. Director of Brad Kacha, uh, Ruben, uh, Ruben here. Director of Strategic Partnerships uh, and uh, Investor Relationship, Brent. That is a team that, and of course, um, our Group Chief Operating Officer, who then moves uh, to his office, and we give him another eight directors. Director of Treasury, Group Director of uh, Technology, Group Director of Special Project, Group Director of Bank Application and Analytics, Group Director of Finance, Chief Risk uh, and Compliance Officer, Group Director of Corporate Banking, and Group Director of SME Banking. That team is headed by Batesh, who is in my office. And then there's management teams and the boards in each of the subsidiaries. So ours is just oversight. We believe this is the hidden treasure that makes equity what it is and makes equity sustainable. Equity is not individuals. It's the structures of governance that have been built and continue to hold. I, uh, let me now close in the next five minutes by going through the financials. Because financials are numbers. Everybody can lead the numbers. The most important thing is to help you understand how the numbers have been derived. What drives these numbers? What, uh, are, what uh, the drivers of numbers? So when we look at intermediation, we have been able to grow uh, the total funding base of the bank to have a trillion shillings, 492 billion shillings, a growth rate, uh, annual growth rate of 14%. And as we can see, deposits grew by 16%. Uh, shareholders funds by 16%. Uh, we were flat on borrowed funds and other liabilities 20%. And basically that's the funding available and the funding structure of the bank. If you look at it, uh, we are talking about 25% of the funding of the bank is long term. It's borrowed funds and shareholders funds. And that creates huge stability uh, in the bank. The next uh, is how we use these funds. Uh, the application of the funds. How have we done? And we see loans take 53% uh, of all the available funding, cash and cash equivalents, 15%, government securities, 23%, another asset that is fixed asset and computers and everything else, uh, 9%. With no growth there, uh, with the government securities growing at 81%. But if you look at Kenya, again, uh, it reflects um, the situation of how the FADs have been applied. Once we apply the FADs, let's see how the results uh, look like. Uh, as we can see, the loan book has shrunk uh, by 5%, cash and cash equivalent up 51% because we said uh, uh, cash is king. So we have decided let's hold cash even if the return is low. Government securities up 81%. And we can see that uh, uh, totals to the 14% growth. But the funding of that, as we have seen, shareholders up 14%, 16%, deposits up. And you can see the balance, such that the mix doesn't uh, get changed. But having got uh, this balance sheet, 
Let's go to the processing uh, and we see interest income, as we said, down by 15%, interest expense up by 15% to cater for the 19% the day and it grows by 21%, reducing total income uh, to only grow by negative 3%. And that's the mitigation. So you can see the yield of the bank moved from 20 to 14%, which is almost a 40% decline. But we have only registered 11%. Why? Because 25% of the loan book is in dollars, so that was shielded and mitigated. It's not affected by interest capping. And a significant 20% of the loan book is in the subsidiaries. What it means is 45% of the loan book is exempt of the effect of the interest capping. And that is a very significant. And of course, loan loss provision, as we said, the conservative. Despite our NPLs leveling out, we have continued to increase provisions. But look at uh, the fact that 20,000 of the staff are now with the agents. We are able to reduce our staff cost. And digitization, we are what we are now doing is train the staff at the agency level, at merchant level, uh, to get. And profit before tax goes down by only 5% despite the 11% uh, decline in interest income, and the same of profit after tax. I'm reliably told that for, for all the banks that have published, this makes us the most profitable bank in Kenya, being 300 million shillings higher than uh, the best uh, bank that has published its results. And we believe and trust that uh, this position will now be sustained, uh, that uh, we become the most profitable bank, not because we didn't lose interest, but because we had interventions that mitigated. Uh, we, if you look, all the banks that have published, they have grown their loans by 16%, but we have uh, uh, outperformed them because the strategy really is not leading to the right results. Our strategy, of shifting uh, to equally yielding risk-free asset seems to have paid. Our regional focus seems to have paid. Our digitization seems to have paid. Our cost, cost focus to from fixed cost to variable cost, shifting all the 20,000 staff to our agents seems to have paid big time. And we expect we can only improve the risk results. It's not just the results. Uh, the next slide. Um, shows that we have been able to give a decent return on equity, which I believe is uh, five, uh, five percentage points, or 500 basis points higher than any of the banks that have published. I think the best I've seen is 19 return on equity. And return on asset, the best I've seen is three. So the bank is able to maintain very uh, highly competitive return. Uh, to its shareholders and hopefully the market will reward uh, the strategy, the winning strategy of equity bank. And uh, lastly uh, is the ratios, Alex, the next slide. Uh, ratios, cost income ratio as we have seen, um, moving in the right uh, direction, both at equity bank and Kenya. Capital is adequate, liquidity is right, cost income, uh, cost of risk, uh, conservative approach. And lastly, the Apex uh, Group Outlook. We had made an outlook last year at the beginning of the year uh, that uh, growth rate uh, in deposits will be, at the end of the year, will be 25. I'm glad we are already at uh, 17 in the first quarter. And so we only have uh, about eight percentage points to cover in the next uh, three quarters. We have no doubt we'll be able to achieve that. Loan growth. Uh, we had projected uh, uh, up to negative five, zero to five. Negative, we had about there. Net interest margin, we had projected uh, nine to 10, we had 8.5. We believe we'll be able to drag that to a minimum of nine. We, we still hold non funded income. By the end of the year, we thought it would be 40. We're at 42. Cost income ratio, 
We had projected 47, which we believe we will achieve. We're still at 50. Return on equity, we had projected 22 to 25. As we see, we are around 24.1. Return on asset, we had projected 3.5 to 4. We're above by to 4.2. Cost of risk, we had projected 1 to 1.25. We are holding at 1.1. As you can see, these numbers, they are derived from strategy. They are not just numbers you throw up to investors. And everything in equity is about uh, strategy. NPLs, we had projected six. We are down uh, by the end of the year. We still hold ourselves, as we have seen. We have stabilized 10 PLs. Now is to reduce them, uh, to bring them down. Um, regional contribution assets, we had projected by the end of the year 30, we had 21. And regional contribution to the profit, we had projected uh, 7 to 8. We are now at 10. We have now increased the projection to 12%. And uh, hopefully, that when we are starting, we will now battle maybe between 12 and 15 uh, by the end of uh, the year because the momentum we have seen in the subsidiaries is amazingly credible. I want to invite Brent, uh, who is the investor relationships, uh, to put on his mic and see whether there is something I've left out. I think, I think uh, thanks James, and, and good morning to everyone. I think what, to, what you would gauge from the, the presentation is three things. One a very decisive management and a very turbulent time, to a, a very responsive business model that is able to, to adjust to, to And resilient. Resilient as well. <laughs> and, then, and then thirdly, the, I think most of our peers have reported so far and what you of the management, two, the, the business model and how responsive and agile it is, and three, you know, the, the outcome of all of that is really how we differentiate ourselves in terms of the execution of the strategy. Um, I think those are just the key things. Mary, anything on strategy you'd like to add? Good morning, and thanks for coming. I just want to, because uh, James has covered uh, most of the items actually in very good detail uh, so that we all understand what the bank is uh, doing and why. But I think uh, what you need to take away uh, on strategy is that we are guided by four key pillars. And the first one is, um, we, we call this the alignment model of equity group. And there are four things we look at. And the first one is um, we have to align the business model to the market and the dynamics in the market. And that is why you heard James talking about, uh, we had to, you know, just to think through and see, is a business model that we have been pursuing in the past still relevant for us? And we have uh, made a tweak. But remember, we also said that we will cause a disruption, first of all, to ourselves. And that is what you can see we have done in the last uh, one year, and we have had the preparations for the last uh, several years. I we think have disrupted the uh, fixed cost delivery channels, and we are now fully on variable cost. It's self-disruption. We have disrupted the over-the-counter with the digital banking. That's a second disruption. We have disrupted our strategy of intermediation to ourselves from a place you go to, to what you do on your phone. Continue, Mary. Yeah, thank you, James. So that disruption has happened, and you can see the effect, you know, moving from just automation to digitization, fully digitized. What does this mean? Customer serves themselves, so you are able to manage staff costs. You are able to manage establishment costs, cost of the branches and all that. And you'll see this going on as we go along. In the next uh, few years, equity will probably look a little bit different in terms of what the brick and mortar branch does vis-a-vis how the customer is able to get the same service, but in a more convenient, more accessible, more efficient way. So that is one. And then, of course, um, the other wing be part of that uh, transformation that is going on. And so that's a very uh, key pillar, the people. And then we look at the systems and the processes, and we ask ourselves, for us to be able to deliver the digitization, 
what are the systems that we require? What are the processes that we require? So the last few years have been spent just, you know, setting up the systems, looking at the processes, and I can tell you a lot of work has happened in this, in this area. And then, of course, when we do all those things, we are looking at the impact on the customers. What does this mean for the customers? And you can see that over the last uh, 10 years, the business model has evolved to become, and James talked about this, especially when you look at um, the hours that we are getting, it's a very inclusive model, business model. We have five. We have uh, both on the business side, we have the personal business, and we are, we are taking uh, care of all the customers. So if you are a corporate customer, we are coming to your ecosystem and says, we want to do business for you. We want to make it or to facilitate the business uh, within your ecosystem, within your value chain. And that is how the corporate banking that James talked about comes in. We are not very much interested in the corporate itself, but it's their, their infrastructure and their ecosystem and their value chain. But of course, when you service their value chain very efficiently, they also want to bank with you, even their own business. And that is why you can see an increase also in Forex uh, business and all that. So it's a very integrated business model and uh, we are continuing to look at that. He talked about the demographics. How do we serve the youth? Give them the self-service model and they will be very happy because they don't want to come to the branch. But one last thing, because of time, uh, James talked about the regional businesses. And you can see we have done, uh, so far, we have done very well, of course, apart from uh, South Sudan, the others have done very well. But remember, we are doing this when DRC grew by 20 branches in the recent few, few months. So you can imagine the cost structure there. But they are that still growing That is tripling the, the branch network from 10 to 30, to 30 in yeah. one year. Uh, doubling the branch network in Tanzania from 6 to 13. Yeah. Uh, Tanzania also grew the branches because uh, they, they also have their own plan for growth. Remember also, they are registering that growth before we have fully introduced the digitization processes and, and dig the digitized, digitized channels for them and for their customers. So things like Easy, the suite of the Easy products, we are yet to fully roll them out. And we are doing that uh, in a very fast way. So you can imagine what will happen once we are able to fully roll out the digitized processes and the digitized channels for these uh, subsidiaries. And when their customers are able to do the self-service um, uh, self uh, banking like we are doing in Kenya, because in Kenya we are fully implemented, but we are yet to support them fully on that. So just look at that and then you can uh, so, sort of you know, see how the business will look out like in the next one year, in the next two years, when most of these initiatives are fully rolled out. Mm -hmm. So all I can say in closing is that we are very confident, we are fully confident that the business model, as we have uh, adjusted it, uh, or as we have actually disrupted it, is going to work for us. And we can only expect uh, very good returns and very better uh, results uh, going forward. Uh, thank you so much for your support. I think uh, from Australia, I would say, take a long-term view on equity. Just imagine, in five years, what you see as other costs will move from being 62% of our total cost to below 30%, simply because hidden in those other costs is all these costs of establishments. Remember, when you are opening 30 branches uh, in, a, in a year, the depreciation the amortization. The last one is, if you remember, 2004, we had only 18 branches in Kenya. In Kenya now, we have 170 branches. All those branches, in three years, five years, they will be fully depreciated. The last two years, we have spent nearly 14 billion shares. Is the investments being amortized? Because it's all condensed, but IT, all that, is five years. Branches, it's seven years. So we believe in the next three years, the biggest uh, transformation that will occur in equity is cost. And cost will be going down a minimum of 20% every year. Why? Because they are depreciation. The good thing is these costs have no cash outflow. And that is why we still have the best cash 
uh, cash flow uh, in the banking industry because it's depreciation. They are not cash-based cost. Other costs in equity are not cash-based cost. But Tesh, not, not a, you know, like a deer caught in the headlights a reaction to uh, the interest rate cap. Remember, this is a very planned and structured execution of equity 3.0. It's a 10-year strategy. So we're executing something that took a lot of time and effort to plan, right? And we're into the second, uh, going into the third year of executing that. We have not changed course. Um, we saw uh, part of the risks in the future. One was uh, disruption. It came earlier. But as James alluded, uh, the execution in many fronts is going well. The cost-income ratio is ahead of its target by two years. So what you're seeing today is the early shoots of the execution of a well-thought-out strategy, which is Equity 3.0, which is available on our website as well. So it's not a knee-jerk reaction to the interest rate cap in Kenya, but it's uh, execution of Equity 3.0 strategy. Now, one of the pillars of that was digitization. Um, we talked about how we've done this in Kenya, but remember, in Kenya, we're operating in an environment that is relatively sophisticated in terms of competition, etc. But in a lot of the other markets, um, the, market, uh, the market environment, the com competitive environment is very different. And over the course of this year, starting from August and going out into quarter four, we're going to launch the full capability that we have in Kenya in those markets. Now, just one example, think about DRC, a country of 82 to 85 million people, only 6% is banked. There is really no digitization out there. But when we go with our full capability there, the potential is huge. And again, this is part of our equity 3.0 strategy. It's always been part of that. So it's executing of a long-term strategy consistently. As I've said, it's the strategic initiatives that we have been pursuing that characterize our uh, strategy 3.0. Kacha, Brad, and people. Anything we have left? Because equity's biggest asset is its people. It is organizational culture. But unfortunately, I never give you a number. Uh, thank you, James. I think uh, there isn't much to add, uh, apart from uh, just stressing the fact that uh, you have observed that since the interest capping, most of our competitors have gone into retrenchment, which you have not done. And this is again in line with what you have said. It's a strategy that we started three years ago, and uh, we have been able to um, make sure that we don't go into retrenchment because as we shift to the digital strategy, we also started aligning our staff to the new strategy as early as uh, 2004, December. And as a result of that, we have seen that we are able to sustain our course because we can allow the shifting of the resources to the most important areas like SME and focus more on the training and reaching the jobs to ensure that our people now are focused and are fully aligned with the new strategy. And basically, uh, that's where you are seeing our cost is going down, not because you are retrenching, but because of the strategy we put in, in place two years ago that are bearing fruit. And we continue with that. So there is no uh, element for us of uh, shock because we are not caught up. Uh, interest capping was just something happened, but it, it did not disrupt our strategy. And I think that cuts across all the lines we are doing with our businesses. Thank you. Since I was presenting outcomes, of strategy. Let me invite Mary to come and take the questions and uh, facilitate where she thinks she can uh, channel a question to somebody else. Mary? Thank you. Let's say. Uh, oh, okay. Is the time now for you to give us any comments, any questions, uh, any clarifications that you may have uh, on the various presentations and the additional comments.